the past die. That's the only way to become what you were meant to be. Darkness rises. And the light to meet it. I need someone to show me my place in all this. Come on! is not going to go the way you think. Well, hello, everyone, Star Wars fans. Uh, this is your host, Chris, on Inside the Sequel again, and we're continuing our path through the sequel trilogy of Star Wars. If you missed last week, last week we talked about The Force Awakens, and what we're doing for this whole month of November, if you didn't know, is we're going through the sequel trilogy of Star Wars um, until the very end of the month. And uh, my continuous, uh, continuing guest on this podcast for the for these Star Wars movies is, uh, again, he's back. It's the host of Cobwebs. It's Daniel. Daniel, how are you, guy? Hey, man. Oh, I'm doing good. Very excited to talk about this movie. Not a controversial film at all. So, you know, perfect thing to talk about on Inside the Sequel. You know, as someone who is host of Inside the Sequel and the types of shits and shenanigans we get into, I am so nervous for today's episode. <laughs> I, I think this is the one where people actually kind of get mad. I don't know. I think you have a good base, a good listener base. I don't think they're the type. And plus, you have always had a very explicitly Last Jedi clip in your intro for this podcast. So, like, if they really hate The Last Jedi that much, then they might have ne- they might have never tuned into this podcast. Oh, true. That's very true. Uh, but yeah, for everyone who doesn't know, we're talking about The Last Jedi from 2017. And uh, this is, t- you know, if we were taking this trilogy by itself, this would be one I want to cover. I would have want to cover it a long, long time ago because it's, you know, it's the second entry in the Star Wars movies. Um, outside of maybe one, this the middle movie for me when I think of Star Wars is like maybe the most pop, like the strongest link from the trilogy and I dare say, I, I think in the sequel trilogy, this is also the strongest movie in the trilogy as well. Yeah, I mean, I, your theory holds true uh, for the most part. Um, you know, you got original trilogy. Uh, New Hope is my favorite, but Empire Strikes Back is the conventional favorite. And Empire Strikes Back is still a perfect movie. I'm actually, I'm doing something kind of fun while we're going through this series. Um, before I rewatch the sequel trilogy we're going to talk about, at some point before that, I rewatch the original trilogy movie. So I watch New Hope, and then I watch Force Awakens, and then I watch Empire, and then went on to um, Last Jedi. So yeah, Empire is, you know, incredible. Um mm-hmm. Attack of the Clones is generally the consensus least favorite of the prequel trilogy. So your theory goes out the window there. But this one, it seems like this one is either your favorite of the sequel trilogy or it is your least favorite. But it is never in the middle. Yeah, this movie has such a line crossed. Like you're on one side or the other. Um, And in no other Star Wars movies like that. And I kind of like it, but I hate it at the same time because what it, um, you know, I think it makes my argument that um, fa- fandoms are maybe the most toxic things and Star Wars fans are just big babies that need to grow up. It kind of, you know, accomplishes that theory I've always had. Or it's the other one where it's like people just like this movie um, and are the real fans, but, you know, they get drowned out in the chaos. And I don't know. I just I, it's been four years since this movie first came out. theaters. We went to go see it together uh, when we were in college. And um, I think your voice um definitely like got deeper after that night you know you, 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 you de- <laughs> my balls dropped after i saw this i i didn't get a chance to check that night but i like to think they did um dude so yeah i, I when i was re i've seen this movie so many fucking times and i know you have too but i can't i just wish people kind of returned back to their thoughts of when they first saw this movie because i feel like ev- i went quickly <laughs> very quickly I, I just typed the last Jedi retrospectives on YouTube to get ready for this, just to see like maybe if the air is cleared a little bit and um, it's such a toxic wasteland that even I don't <laughs> feel comfortable in. Hey everybody, Ryan Johnson here. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, me taking a huge giant dump. I was just too busy shitting all over the this Star movie Wars took franchise. Everything that you like about Star Wars, that you love about Star Wars, that you thought you knew about Star Wars and it <laughs> on it and it on it again and then it sets it on I don't fire even have and then it's on it again fucking thing to say about this movie it just it is just rules me up diarrhea. so much rage inside of my body that it starts 
lighting my brain cells on fire. And it's just like, wow, things, some things maybe just don't change, you know? You know, after I feel like th- I have to say something after you drew a hard line in the sand by calling Star Wars fans babies and such. Um, let me just say that I don't intend to come into this podcast going off on angry rants about all of the people who hated this movie. Like, that's not my goal coming into this. Um, I'm really just here to celebrate a movie that I love. But also, I watched this for the first time post Rise of Skywalker leading up to this podcast. I hadn't rewatched this movie after Rise of Skywalker came out. I don't think. Um, <laughs> and uh, I watch this movie a lot, so it's possible. But I... I I will say that like, it's an interesting experience watching it after Rise of Skywalker. And there are certain complaints about this movie that I understand, although I don't agree with, um, because I think a lot of the complaints about this movie, I don't think they are objectively problems with the movie, but I can sort of understand if it's a choice that you're not into. So yes, there are those people out there that are insufferable and obnoxious. And, and, and I really had a period of my Star Wars fandom where I was angry at those people and very annoyed at those people. And I've cooled a lot since then. Um, and I haven't even engaged in any conversation about this movie, except with people I know who love it. I have not looked up any discourse about this movie. So I'm not as brave as you. I did not YouTube Last Jedi thoughts from any YouTubers. Um, so I've cooled a lot. So I'm not coming in here angry in any way. I'm just coming in here to celebrate a movie that I love. Bruh, you gotta watch the discourse videos. They're like they're like the most popcorn entertainment I've I get outside the movie theaters. I don't get enjoyment out of that kind of thing, really. <laughs> it's just like if there's a Star Wars movie that people wish they could go back and fix out of every Star Wars movie. Everyone wants to fix this movie. <laughs> I've noticed whether it's TikTok, it's YouTube, it's something. It's always this movie. But it's weird because this movie made so much fucking money. This movie was like, it has like the, it's like the tomato, the tomato meter has like such a divide as well. You know, people talk about like Eternals and like all these other movies, like the fans loved it, but the critics hate it. And this kind of argument of like how we rate movies now, you know, kind of the, I feel like the Last Jedi was kind of like that too. I feel like it was the movie that kicked that off. I Mm -hmm. don't feel like people were really talking about the difference between the critics and the fans on Rotten Tomatoes Mm -hmm. before this movie. This movie was a turning point in fandom, I think. Um, This is where blockbuster movies became contentious. And I don't feel like they were as much before this. You know, you had your anger about casting decisions and stuff like that. There were people that were angry about Ben Affleck being cast as Batman and such. Um, but I, I do feel like this was a bit of a turning point in fandom. It was a strange time for sure. 2017. Yeah. And you know, Ryan Johnson gets to take the, the mount for after JJ Abrams force awakens. So we talked a lot about JJ Abrams. Um, let's talk about Ryan Johnson. I know you, you said you watched one of his movies recently. I, at least I saw on letterbox. Um, what are your thoughts on him? Like what's he, like when coming into this movie, I didn't know a lot of works outside of Looper for Ryan Johnson. I didn't watch Brick yet. I knew of Brick, but I didn't see it. Um, To me, it was just like another, from what I understood, a guy who was a big Star Wars fan coming in to do a Star Wars movie. Well, I'm a big fan of Ryan Johnson. I think he's a terrific filmmaker. Um, I think he's he's a very knowledgeable movie fan. He was on the Pure Cinema podcast a little while ago, and he was so great, so much fun to listen to. Um, I like all of his movies. I just recently watched the only movie from him I had seen, which is The Brothers Bloom. And I did think it was his weakest movie, but it's still a good time. It's like a fun con artist movie with Mark Ruffalo and Adrian Brody and Rachel Weisz. Um, it's fun, but I, I feel like all the rest of his movies like transcend fun. Um, like <laughs> Knives Out is an unbelievable piece of popcorn entertainment. It mm. is spectacular. Uh, Looper, I thought Looper was brilliant back in 2012. Not a movie I rewatch very often, but it's a very intelligent little piece of grim science fiction. And Brick is like this teen, he made a noir film into a high school movie. And, uh, and it's a really enjoyable time. So yeah, I think Ryan Johnson's a great filmmaker. But beyond that, I think he gets Star Wars better yeah. than anyone else who's made a Disney Star Wars movie movie i'm saying i'm not putting him like above dave filoni or something like that um but i i do feel like he gets the spirit of star wars so well uh but even beyond that because jj abrams he gets the spirit of star wars very well too 
he gets the philosophy of Star Wars, I think. And I think he thinks about Star Wars on a much deeper level than how it feels or how it's fun or what it looks like. Um, I think he thinks much more deeply about the themes of Star Wars. And this movie has some great themes, like very explicit and on the nose, like they're not deep in that way, but very, very interesting. And it's a Star Wars movie that like has things to say, which is very, very cool. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking when you were talking about the pure cinema podcast, I was like, I'm waiting for my call up to that podcast and who would, who I would be with there. And uh, I just know my, my, my call up is going to be with Paul W S Anderson on there talking about video game to movie adaptations. <laughs> have you given yeah, this thought? Let me know when you get, get that call. Yeah. You, have you thought about when you're getting your call up to the pure cinema podcast? These are things you need to be like getting ready for Daniel. Believe it or not. I've never thought about it, but I, I did get the chance to have Brian Sauer on my podcast. He's a very nice man. It was great to talk to him. You see, if I got my call up with him, it's just going to be about um, the, 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 the toxic environment that is boutique label collecting. I just know that'll be an episode in the future. I don't, I don't think it will. <laughs> I don't think it will. Uh, but no, to piggyback off that, when I rewatched Star Wars again, um, it feel I agree with you. It feels like a fan got to make their movie. You know what I mean? Like an adult man got to make his movie because finally was, an adult man got to make a movie. Well, you know what I mean? Like an, it, an adult who grew up watching Star Wars and loved Star Wars got to do the Star Wars movie the way they wanted to. Um, like nobody got to stop them from doing what they, you know, I feel like he got full creative, um, you know, opportunities to make this movie because he does make a lot of callbacks in this movie. He like dwells into like certain themes uh, that, that you've seen in star Wars, but they never really got that far. Um, you get a lot of adult themes too. People criticize this movie for being very nihilistic. And this movie does have a lot of nihilistic choices at times. Um, but it fits still in the world of star Wars that we've, we've come up to this point. And I really like it. It's a change of pace movie from Force Awakens to this one. But then you can say the same thing about um, Empire Strikes Back is a significantly darker movie than A New Hope. I, I don't know if you would say that with the Clone Wars outside of maybe there's just there's more action in that movie and it's more political, but it kind of still fits that helm. And I really enjoy that. I think it's what Star Wars needed up to this point. Um I think the biggest problem was that people saw Ryan Johnson's movie and, and they got different choices than the, they expected. Like, I think from going from after force awakens to right before last Jedi comes out, I think people had preconceived notions of these characters and where the story was going. And that was not what they got at all with last Jedi. And I think people still are coming to terms of what kind of they saw with that, because I mean, when, you know, with, when it comes to fans, we like to build things up and we like to, to imagine with the what ifs. And if we don't get, it, it's kind of a letdown with the signs are there. Um, and I think that's kind of the problem with why people didn't like this movie initially. You know, it's funny. Uh, I actually haven't heard the nihilism criticism before. And wow, I don't see that at all. For me, this is a very hopeful, optimistic and like love centered movie uh, to me. And, and it's funny when I saw it, when I first saw it, I didn't love everything about it. There are definitely certain things that I had to wrap my head around. Um, certain things that I didn't like then, but that I really like now. But I did not get the feeling that it was going to be a controversial movie when I saw it. That didn't occur to me. I didn't ever feel like it didn't feel like Star Wars. Um, I didn't, like when I saw their choice with Luke, it did not even occur to me that this was a choice I was uncomfortable with or that any of the choices were going to be controversial, blah, blah, blah. Like for me, I had that experience with Rise of Skywalker where I had like massive expectations going in and it wasn't what I expected. I was like, huh, okay. And I knew watching that movie, that that movie was going to be controversial. Um, and I, maybe I just knew that more because I'd already lived through Last Jedi and I knew that every Star Wars movie is going to be controversial now. Uh, but with this movie, I didn't, I didn't think about any of that. Like to me, like, Felt like a great kick-ass Star Wars movie. And I still think that. Although I do now see the things where I think like, hmm, I get it if people don't like this. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into those things specifically. Yeah, I think it, because you didn't, like you said last episode, you weren't like the biggest Star Wars guy going in. 
um, until going into Force Awakens Awakens. necessarily. Yeah, but I was Mm -hmm. by this point. So I think like throughout this whole trilogy, like Disney's buyout of Star Wars, you know, these people, the fans, I I shouldn't say these people because like I'm a part of it too and and everything like that. But I feel like they were like the the imagination was running wild. And I read the comments, I look at some of the videos of like the dark negative aspect. I I really do. The dirty work of this podcast, I have to go into places I don't feel comfortable in, in the comment sections of these fandoms and, and really stoke the fire and like have to read these things and digest them. I try to send you all in my, my close friends chats, these things I find to make you barf (laughs) like I do. This was the opposite of my intention going into this. I didn't want to touch any of that. (laughs) I just have to let the people know that Chris isn't just hosting something. I'm going in. I'm like... I'm like McGruff, the crime dog. I'm sniffing out all this negative energy and soaking it all in. Um, And it's just like, it's crazy to think like how people took this movie. Um, The Nile, going back to the nihilistic choice, just like give a a fair, you know, viewpoint on that. Other than that, it's just like the the character choice. I mean, this movie, I I hear the most hate went to like Luke and Haldo and like Snoke and Finn and Rose. And it's just the list goes on and on and on and on. But for someone like you, Amy, who enjoy this movie a lot, I was the same way. I after we left the movie theater, I remember we we were just talking about after it felt different. Like it felt like I hadn't seen a Star Wars movie kind of like this at all before. So I didn't know what my reaction was. And I'm pretty sure we went to go see it like the next day after. and I absolutely love the movie after that. I saw the movie how many times in theaters. I just think that this movie just has a good, like you said, it has a lot of good messages of hope and stuff. But I want to ask um, your initial thoughts on the first watch. I kind of gave you mine. I just was kind of like shell shocked. I was just like, I've never seen a Star Wars movie like this before. I didn't know Star Wars could be like this. This is really weird and different and cool. I have like kind of no words to put it. Do you remember like your first thoughts watching this movie guy? Yeah, totally. You know, it's funny. I feel like you can split this movie up pretty easily into three different parts, not by acts, but by there is the Luke, Ray and Kylo stuff. There is the Poe and Holdo stuff. And there is the Finn and Rose stuff. And, Mm -hmm. And my initial opinion going when I finished the movie was I was flat out head over heels down on my knees. Will you marry me to everything with Ray, Luke and Kylo? Everything in there I adored. Poe and Holdo stuff, I remember I liked it. I didn't have a strong opinion on it, but I liked it. It was good. I didn't like the Finn and Rose stuff at the time. And that is the part that I have like wildly shifted my opinion on because by now I love the Finn and Rose stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that was generally my opinion. Uh, Whereas like I love basically two thirds of it. There was this one part I felt like wasn't very interesting. And I think really the problem with it though is just on a first watch, I just want to get back to Ray, Luke and Kylo. Like, that's what I want to see everything else. I was like, Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I want to watch Ray, Kylo and Luke. Um, but on, on rewatches, I, I love all that stuff pretty much. Yeah. That's the stuff that feels like the entertainment part of it. And then like the Ray, Luke and um, Kylo stuff feels like the more like interesting, like new kind of territory we're kind of going through with the storyline. Um, cause I've always, I don't know how you've watched star Wars, how I've always watched star Wars is there's the force and like the Jedi and the Sith segments of the movies. And then there's the, for everyone who's not interested in that, you get the entertainment of Han and, and Chewie and Leia's story totally. and, and adventure. And then and I think that's the, one thing people don't like about the prequels is they don't really have that. It's just no. Jedi Sith stuff. Yes. Um, and even though they get a lot of that Jedi and Sith stuff, right. I mean, there is no balance though. The balance to those prequel movies is just action. Like here's Jedi's flipping, here's clones fighting droids. And, you know, that's about it for two and a half hour or an hour and a half of the two hours. Um, But this movie, I think it had so many like what the F moments for me, even on rewatches on rewatches. I always think to like, you know, snow confronting Ray and, and Kylo. Um, this movie moves very quickly, even though it's a longer Star Wars movie. It moves so fucking quick. Like you get straight to the action right away the dreadnoughts act opening i think is a very very, maybe maybe the strongest opening to a star wars movie i remember just like being so invested and like so entertained with poe and his his banter with bba um his like the whole flute is taking down a dreadnought and then you get the 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 doom and gloom of like is this last ship gonna make it or not i was like this is a fucking intense 20 minutes to the opening of the movie if it's even that long 
Um, I don't honestly, think it, dude, it could it could be the strongest opening to a Star Wars movie. Yeah, like it this, is an all timer space battle. Yes, I, the part that I love the most is when Poe is getting chased by the Tie Fighters, and he kind of like puts his arm down and like kind of helps maneuver the ship to turn around and then turn around and face the tie, the tie fighters and shoot them down. I'm like, that is fucking cool. Like I've never seen that in a Star Wars movie. That is so cool. It solidifies the fact that Poe is like the ACE pilot for the resistance. Um, or, and, and I don't know, just, and it, and it gives you so much all at once. It gives you the comedy of like uh, Hux and Poe. And po. It kind of gives you the great action. It gives you the, the, the it, it just, it just, the, you know, just when you think of great openings, it just, it just solidifies that. And this movie has so many like maybe best moments of all Star Wars. And that's what people always say when they have a negative like thing to say about this movie. Well, I didn't like this because of this, but I will say this also was really great. You know, it's like, so you didn't personally like things in this movie, but you have to admit this movie did so many amazing things for the franchise up to the point, you know? I also have a favorite part in the opening, and it's another thing that I don't feel like I've ever seen in Star Wars, on a Star Wars movie, that is. Uh, and I, look, I looked up the actress. It's Veronica Nyo as uh, Paige Tico. Paige Tico is uh, Rose Tico's sister. Oh, okay. And she has this amazing little mini story in the mm-hmm. middle of this space battle. Uh, she doesn't have a single line, but you see her, uh, you see her get hit. You see her trying, basically she's trying to, to drop bombs. Um, and, and it's so like, you know, World War II movie inspired. <laughs> and no, it doesn't make any sense for if they're in space, the way the bombs just drop, but it's Star Wars space battles have always been influenced by World War II movies. And that's what this is. But, um, but she dies at the end of that sequence. And I've, I just don't feel like I've ever cared that much about a random X-Wing pilot. Like we all love Porkins. Mm -hmm. We all love Wedge Mm -hmm. much because of like Mm -hmm. uh, extra material comics and books and stuff like that. But (laughs) I don't feel like just based on a movie, like an X-Wing fighter, a random X-Wing fighter has ever meant so much. And uh, that is just such a great little section within this battle. And it's the main thing I remember from this opening. Yes. And then also after all that great stuff is finished, the writing and the dialogue for all these characters are, it's so great. This like, there's so many iconic lines in this movie, but one I also remember the most is when Poe gets slapped by Leia and he goes like, there was heroes that, that died there. And she's like, dead heroes, no leaders, you know? Cause it gives weight to the, the, you know, to the resistance that like they're, they don't have like this endless number of volunteers. Like you got in like a new hope at times because their numbers gradually increased or like with the clones of the Republic, like these are people fighting for their lives and like every death matters in this, you know, this new trilogy. And um, I've always enjoyed that part in the last Jedi, the last Jedi always del- for me had always delivered really cool like moments and like set in action set pieces, but also giving you the realistic, like, Hey, well, this was really great, but now look at the consequences of these actions or these, these events. Like it gives you like investment in these characters and like in the world. And that's why I like the last Jedi so much because I feel like I know these characters and I'm with them in the trenches. And it, the, the first order feels like it's like the most ruthless thing in the universe. Like I, like I am scared of them in this movie because they are just like, insanely evil and they're constantly getting dubs over the resistance it's crazy yeah the first order is really scary in this movie um so two blockbusters came out in 2017 that are honestly two of my very favorite blockbusters of the last many years uh and it's the last jedi (laughs) the last jedi and ghost in the shell no just kidding not ghost in the shell Uh, what Uh, it's (laughs) it's the last jedi and wonder woman and what i feel like the two of them have in common is they are two movies that are deeply, deeply concerned with saving lives. Like when I saw Wonder Woman, I remember thinking like, I don't think I've ever seen a superhero care this much about just saving random people and being so devastated when she fails. Like you never, you know, I know a lot of people love Man of Steel, but you most certainly never see that from Henry Cavill and Man of Steel. (laughs) And this movie is the same way where like the main point of this movie is just we got to save as many resistance leaders as possible. And so much of this movie is just concerned with, we need to get our ship out of here. So the first order doesn't kill us. And that's so much the crux of the movie. It's just, we got to get our ship out. Um, And I love that. I I think that's really, really cool that it's not just about, we got to blow up the bad guys. It's like, we got to save lives and we can't, you know, like, okay, there were heroes on that mission. 
but they're dead. They're dead now. And that's mm-hmm. not acceptable. And Seriously. I really love that. Yeah. And I really like this movie came out 2017 because we were spoiled as uh, cinephiles that, that that year had endless amazing movies. Oh, it was a really good year, man. A really good. Year. I mean, dude, it's crazy to think that the best movie that came out that year was what again? Uh, the Shape of Water is what I would say. Oh, well, what did we, what did Mitch and all three of us decide it was? <laughs> oh, no. Logan. <laughs> what was it? Was Logan, it Logan? is my last Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> it's the movie that like everybody loves and i'm like what are you people thinking wait did we actually all decide that logan was a, was our pick i voted against it but you and mitch voted for it Dude, honestly I'm... like i didn't kick it out because i didn't think it stood a chance because i didn't know you were such a big logan fan dude oh well, man <laughs> I, I miss mitch dude like i really miss him well, he's too he's busy he's hanging out with his buddy mike flanagan i miss him dude i just want i just wish i could have mitch next to me watching last jedi and then punching me on my gut and saying oh, nerd you like that stuff oh wussy oh. <laughs> uh we miss you mitch um yeah i you know i second everything you say um i remember we were talking about last Jedi the other day not because we were like just going to be podcasting about it but we were talking about like fucking like jumanji and then this movie and like we were talking about like i love when it comes to movies i love talking about numbers because to me that also gives like i don't know how I to do say too this. actually it, it kind of gives like validation in an odd way or like i feel like i'm a part of contributing to this massive success um, well i think it's interesting because like what movies make money determines what other movies you're gonna get in the future Mm, yeah yeah and last jedi made so much fucking money like out of my it's the top grossing movie of 2017 i mean Mm -hmm. let's not beat around the bush here it made more money than any movie that year and you know what without even the movie coming out the fucking poster alone and the trailer was more than enough to make that like warrant like do you remember when that trailer got a lot like announced and seeing that poster my 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 eyes were my head, like my head was spinning. I was like, "What the fuck is this movie gonna be about?" And then people like philosophers of the Star Wars Reddit's were like, "Oh, always remember the villain looms behind the poster, and it's fucking Luke Skywalker." And people were having all these thoughts and stuff. It was so it's such a different time than where we are now. You know what's funny? I don't remember the poster for this movie. This movie is the least hype that I had going into any of the sequel trilogy Star Wars movies. And it had nothing to do with the movie. It was just that I was in my senior year of college and I was very busy. Um, so no, I don't remember the trailer. Just hyping um, yourself up. I didn't like it wasn't a big deal when I went to see it. Uh, like I I went, I mean, you know, I was really happy to see a new Star Wars movie, but I remember we went, we went to college in a small town and we went to the the theater there in that town. And it wasn't even sold out. Like it was the polar opposite from my opening night Force Awakens experience. It Dude, just felt my, like going to see a movie. One of my biggest stresses that night was wondering if we were gonna get good seats or even tickets for that movie. <laughs> yeah, and then there weren't even very many people in there. <laughs> Oh boy. Uh, and then I remember like we got wedgies on the way to the movie theater because the, all the big bullies were there and they're like, look at these nerds going to see Star Wars. Because- oh yeah, that's what college was like for sure. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Dude, oh. I-, I just want the listeners to imagine Chris on Inside the Sequel being in a small college town, like a very small college. Like that's like a recipe for like disaster. And a disaster it was. Okay, I'm <laughs> yanking us back on track. So another thing I love about this movie is I do feel like Ryan Johnson takes very smart and very logical steps for how to take these characters forward. And a lot of people don't like the steps, but I think they totally make sense. So with Finn, I I mentioned this on the force awakens episode, but Finn is not a true believer in the resistance in that movie. Um, By the, the end of the movie, all he cares about is getting as far away from the first order as possible. And you know what? Let's just start. Let's talk about the Finn Rose storyline. Cause this is something that like I wasn't into the first time. And I think, what, what the Finn Rose storyline really reminds me of now is a, an episode of the Clone Wars or one of the like animated Star Wars shows. Like it kind of feels like that to me, which makes me kind of like, yeah, it makes sense that I wasn't as into it the first time because I want to get back to the massive epic awesomeness of Ray Kylo Luke. Uh, and this is like this is like a kind of a side Star Wars adventure. But now I, I love it. I think it's really, really fun. I love Rose. I wasn't sure how I felt about Rose at first. And now like, I love that character. Mm-hmm. I do think part of it has something to do with the fact that like, I feel protective now of Kelly Marie Tran because the internet was so mean to her and she's really come out the other side and she's 
doing really great work now. And I think that's so cool for her, but she's, she's a delightful presence in this movie. I enjoy the casino. The casino kind of feels like the prequels, yeah. um, which is something that I dig. It doesn't feel like anything you would see in the original trilogy. Mm. And I have heard some people say that the casino is lame because it just feels like earth. It doesn't feel like star Wars, but I would say, we go to a lot of bars in Star Wars. In, mm-hmm. uh, in A New Hope, we, we go to that, the cantina. It's a bar. This is the high class bar. This is the bar that the rich people go to. That totally makes sense to me. Yeah. Oh my gosh, dude. So I never had a problem with Rose. I never thought she was like a bad character. I wasn't like super ultra defensive of Rose either. I was just like, yeah, she's a character in the Star Wars universe. How many characters do we get in the Star Wars movies? I mean, there's a lot of characters within all of Star Wars that get like a one-off like big moment in one movie and they kind of slowly fade out kind of thing. You know, that's always been a Star Wars thing. I have no problems with added characters, but you know, the fixation on Rose Hay was weird to me. And it, like you said, it was despicable. This last watch, I swear to God, I was just like, why is there hate on this character? If anything, she's one of the more strong characters in this whole movie. Like her dialogue is great. Her acting is superb. I like the character. She has comedy, but she also has a lot of depth to her in less than a, in, in only one movie. Um, and, and, and she like actually gives a lot of questions and like information to like main characters of like the central three characters of like every Star Wars movie. Cause you always get like Obi-Wan, Anakin and Padme, Luke, Leia and Han. So, so on, so on. And she does that. Um, you don't get a character like Rose in really any of the other movies, the way she kind of delivers and is part of the grand scheme of the story. And they you know cancel by. Interest- you know oh, what's interesting ahead. about Rose is she is the character who now reveres the new characters we met in Force Awakens. So the characters in Force Awakens were like, oh my God, it's Han, it's Chewbacca. It's, oh, they're talking about Luke Skywalker. I thought he was a myth. Rose is the one that's like, oh my God, Finn. He's, mm-hmm. he's a resistance hero. So she's like the audience surrogate for like maybe little kids that are, that loved Ray and Finn and Poe from the first movie. Mm-hmm. But also she's she's not important in the resistance. She mm-hmm. works behind the scenes, but she's such a pure, true believer. And that's who Finn needed, I think, to really teach him the value of the resistance. Very well said. And the Canto Bites. I like the Canto Bites stuff. To, like you said, it feels like a higher class bar. It feels like, the, one of the great things about Star Wars, and you go to any fucking Star Wars trivia night, you go to any Star Wars like you know meetup, whether it's a comic book shop or a video I love game those Star Wars yeah. meetups. Yeah, like whether it's a comic <laughs> book store, the video store, whatever you see with your fucking Star Wars fans. Um, one thing I always enjoy is flexing Star Wars knowledge, and one of the big Star Wars knowledge pieces was like knowing what the name of the planets were throughout the movies, whether they were mentioned once or twice the entire movie, or you had to look it up yourself or watch the fucking special features on the VHSs at the end of the fucking movie. If you know where Cantobite is, Cantobite is, it feels like added knowledge to the Star Wars universe that we never got before, and that's how I saw it. And people hated that. It's like, oh, you know, this is sidetracking to the main story. It's useless, like you know, filler for the movie. And like we're discovering a new planet we never heard of before. We're meeting and seeing new, different alien species doing what normal alien species are doing in this universe. We got it in in Maz's cantina. Um, I love that little fucking alien that's like drunk and try to feed coins to <laughs> BBA. I love yeah. that. I fucking love that little shit so much. <laughs> Every time I see that movie, I always crack up. <laughs> it's like, he's just so funny and it's well designed. All the aliens in this movie look amazing. Even the fucking snitch that's saying like, oh, I told him they couldn't park their speeder in the beach, oh, yeah, but then they him. go to the straight to the casino. I'm like, you fucking snitch. Like they're here to gamble. God damn it. <laughs> Like, this is I love Star that it's Wars. all about parking. Like they get captured because they parked incorrectly. <laughs> right. And how many Star Wars movies do we get where the security isn't just stormtroopers? Like it's actually human security. You know what I mean? Like in all of like the original trilogy and everything, it's all like stormtroopers. Even in The Force Awakens, the fuzz is the fucking stormtroopers in the, in the first resistance. Finally, we get some, some security that's like humans, like that's employed by other like beings in Star Wars. You know, not everything is just... A to B, you know, bad guy, good guy. And that's how it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Cantobite sequence is so important. And this is like, I sometimes hear like the same as you, like people wanting to fix last Jedi. And again, like, I don't want to rant against these people against these people, but a lot of times I hear get rid of the Cantobite sequence and the, the Cantobite sequence is so important because what it does is it shows the first orders effect on real people. 
and mm-hmm. it shows that not not aside from soldiers, just how real people are being affected by the oppression of the first order and how it's making some people rich, but everyone else is suffering. And I've heard some people say that, oh, it, it feels weird that like they threw this animal cruelty message into this movie. You know, nothing wrong with an animal cruelty message, but I don't <laughs> think that's what this is. I think this is about showing this is how normal people and normal creatures, because alien creatures and animals, like they matter too in the Star Wars universe. This is how they're affected by the First Order. And Finn sort of sees that like, we got to make these people pay. Like we can't let these people get away with this. So Finn, he moves away from, I just want to survive because that's, DJ, Benicio Del Toro, who we'll talk mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. Benicio Del Toro is, I think he's Finn's possible future because he's the guy who's like, I'm not going to take sides. I'm not going to fight in this war. I just want to get by. I just want to survive. And Finn realizes, I don't want to do that. That's not the right thing to do. So I'm going to be rebel scum, which is Ooh, awesome. That's such a good analysis. Daniel, you are an intelligent movie watcher. <laughs> You've got that you, trophy. Thank you. Um, to me, I love the Canto Bite because it just feels like a sense of urgency to the story. This movie literally feels like it's like a Red Bull, like a Red Bull vodka. Like it's it's a little like, you know, it feels good and it's entertaining at start. And then it's like it amps up the intensity of the movie. And then it kind of slows down to like a really great, you know, end of the movie. But when the Canto Bite stuff, to me, it's like this is stuff like they they're like getting caught. Like I when people are thinking of cancer by thinking it's annoying, I'm thinking they need to get the fuck in and get the fuck out because they are on a time constraint. The whole move, the whole time they're there, they're like talking to Poe about like, we found the guy or we, we we're heading that way now. And they're like, hurry up. And it's like, they get caught. Like they start creating the, the chaos to try and escape. And it's like, this is important because it gives the, the, the idea that like they need to, they can't just like go and visit this planet. They need to get the hell out. And uh, that's what the whole movie is. It's all about timing. It's urgency. It's understanding. It's like trying to get everything. Like imagine the chaos of trying to coordinate all your friends to meet at one place all at the same time. So you're not waiting and go and do shit. Oh, with it's, some of our friends, it's impossible. It's stressful. Yes, it's stressful. <laughs> it's an, I mean, have you ever tried fucking getting coordinated times for inside the sequel guests and me? Like I'm always five <laughs> to 10 minutes late. Like that's that. Then I don't have a fucking, um, snoke ship behind me blasting cannings on my shield either it's like like come on people like i know it's star wars but like you know timing is still a thing and it's still a hard thing to 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 kind of manage as well what do you think about benicio del toro's performance you know he didn't have to go that hard but he really did for the fans (laughs) (laughs) it's funny getting such like a a massive a-list star to just kind of like guest star in the middle of the star wars movie yeah yeah and you don't really see that anywhere else but i guess disney had to flaunt the wallet just a little bit yeah i guess so i (laughs) i like him one thing that i like about him is um he he also kind of represents how this movie subverts expectations which it does quite a bit and that star wars is famous for having lovable scoundrels right Mm. and you kind of think that might be dj but no in the end He's just a scoundrel. Like he's just a dick and he is not going to be redeemed. And I love how he exits the movie where Finn's like, oh, you're going to regret this or something like that. And he just says, maybe. Yeah. And he leaves and he never comes back. And I kind of love that. Yeah. Yeah. They really sold his character for the promos for this movie. I will say though, this movie is shameless for its plugging of merchandising. That's every Star Wars movie, man. (laughs) Are you talking about the Porgs? Dude, the fucking porgs. Did you some stuffed porgs? Good God, I almost went to bankruptcy for those damn things. I worked at GameStop during this time, so I got exclusive sneak peeks into what kind of Star Wars merchandise we were going to be getting. And uh, as soon as I saw porgs were a fucking thing, I was like, I don't know what the fuck this is, but I'm all about it. It's too bad porgs got totally overshadowed by Grogu by now. You okay? Oh my God, seriously. Like I, I've taken the poor Xing stickers off my car and shit like that. Yeah, it's 100% Grogu. I almost bought a Chia Pet Grogu the other day. <laughs> um, that's the lasting impact on it. And that's what Grogu people- Grogu is goaded. He's actually goaded. Like he's like on a Mount Rushmore somewhere. <laughs> um, but this movie, dude, so like- <sighs> This mo- so now we talk about like the Finn and the Rose stuff because I I mean you would you know I agree there like it's it's really good stuff but and when it comes to like the Ray and like this Luke and like the the Kylo stuff 
do you remember like that? I feel like that's when Raylo really started happening and people were really wanting that kind of thing to happen. All because yes. we saw Adam Driver shirtless and it's like, yes, it's hot as hell. But like, just because he's shirtless doesn't mean we want to, you know, like wipe him up. Well, you know, here's the thing. I kind of went through an evolution with the Raylo thing. Because uh, in between the two years, between Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, in the beginning, I was totally opposed to Raylo. I was like, what are you guys talking about? That's dumb. They're not into each other. Um, like Kylo is just a bad guy. And for a long time, that's all I wanted. Like, I just wanted Kylo to be a villain. I just want him to be the dick. And I want him and Raylo to fight and for Ray to kill him. Cause like by the end of this movie, as much as I love the performance, I love the character. Like I also like in a good way, hated the character. And I'm like, I hate this guy. He is horrible. Somebody needs to kill him. More times rewatching the movie. And especially like now when I rewatch it now, I see now that this is a horny Star Wars movie. <laughs> I do think it's a horny movie. I, I really do feel the sexual attraction between Ray and Kylo. And I think it informs their choices. Like, I don't think Ray is as certain that Kylo can be turned if she doesn't see him shirtless and isn't into that. <laughs> like, she's like, this is like, she begins, she turns, she sees him as first at first as like, um, the devil or something like Dracula or some, something evil, something treacherous totally snake. evil. Yes. <laughs> treacherous snake by the middle of the movie. Now he's the phantom of the opera. Like, Oh, he's bad. He's scary, but he's kind of sexy and he's kind of alluring. And I'm, I'm like drawn in by his dark emo boy, creepy mystique. Like he's, <laughs> he's kind of the phantom of the opera by the middle of this movie to her. Um, of course that shifts as the movie goes along. And now I love that man. I think it's a really cool, interesting part of the movie. And I completely understand the Raylo shippers. I must admit like Raylo shippers out there. I see you. I hear you. I don't judge you. I just like the body positivity for Adam driver in this movie. <laughs> like it confirmed to me that I didn't have to be a six, a, a six pack bulking MCU actor to be like considered attractive. You know, I could be a normal guy with some long hair. He looks like a Marine. Cause he was, he kind of looks like a Roblox. Like, like Roblox, you ever see those things? Like they look like Legos that are blocky. That's what he kind of looks like to me. He looks like the type of, like when he's shirtless and she's like, you really can't put anything else on. And he's just standing there. He looks like he's about to tell me he just puked in his room. Like when I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> like, and I love that. This movie, if you want to know something about Chris and cinema, if you can have any room, any wiggle room for memes, you're 100% certified fresh in my mind. And this movie kind of gives you that. Um, Every Star Wars movie gives you the memes. Oh, dude. Yeah, seriously. Um, (laughs) None more than Revenge of the Sith, though. Let's give the crown where the crown is due. That's true. But, you know, Revenge of the Sith would have been a little bit sweeter if it had Swolo. Swolo? (laughs) Ben Swolo. Ben (laughs) Swolo. Yeah, I love, dude. So, like, I used to think it was kind of like the slower moments for me in in The Last Jedi. Like, when Rey and Kylo were talking to each other. Um, in that scene, like they see each other, but they're not together. But upon a rewatch, I was like, this is good stuff. This is the, the first time, like we see force, like, like you get this sort of in Revenge of the Sith when Anakin is crying, when he's looking across Coruscant and sees Padme oh and, God, and that she's is crying. Goaded Star Wars moment. Yeah. And he, cause like they feel each other and like, they understand what's going to happen or what's going on. Stop I it. Kinda, stop it. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I get those kind of moments in this movie with Ray and Kylo as they're talking to each other. Cause like, there's one part where it's not aggressive from Ray. Cause Ray's mostly the aggressor to Kylo throughout the whole movie. Um, but she's just, like Kylo just goes, why is the force doing this to us? You know? And she's like kind of calling out to him and they're kind of like more just talking than like being like nemesis and rivals in any aspect. Um, and it's like the whole movie is based for Ray is based around understanding what happened between Luke and Kylo because they're both like guys who like had beef, but they don't want to come into terms and talk about it. They just kind of want to just hate each other from a distance. And you get and, the Rashomon sequence, which was really cool. Right, right. I haven't seen Rashomon, so I don't understand that. 
Oh, no problem. It's a it's a Kurosawa movie. Of course, Kurosawa is heavily influenced on all of Star Wars. Uh, but basically in the movie, you see the same event from several different perspectives. And every time from the different perspective, it looks different. It feels different, even though it's the same event. And, and that's what you get in this movie where you see Luke consider killing Kylo from his perspective and from Kylo's perspective. And from his perspective, he's like a momentary lapse of judgment. I never would have done that. And then then misunderstood me and from kylo's perspective it's like this old bastard is gonna murder me Mm -hmm. fuck him i am leaving Mm -hmm. and uh and it's interesting you know seeing the exact same thing uh and they both perceive it very differently but i think the way both of them perceive it uh is like understandable well this is one of the few times in inside the sequel where chris doesn't understand um, a Criterion film reference. I just want that to be made now. Rashomon is uh, it's pretty good. I think yeah. you should check it out. It's pretty oh. good. Yeah. <sighs> Dude, you think we talk about Criterion films on this fucking podcast? I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. It was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, to me, that stuff is very, very good because not only is it good writing and it's good dialogue and there's a lot happening. But it probably is some of the like the sexiest cinematography throughout the whole movie. Oh my the gosh, island, yes. The island, like that's another thing I have in my notes. You know, people say what you will about Last Jedi. It probably is one of the best directed and one of the best choreographed, like one of the best cinematography films because like it's shot on locations. Um, the set pieces are beautiful. The colors are amazing. And I'm not just saying that because I bought a new 75 inch TV, but like. Anytime I've seen Last Jedi, it's probably the most beautiful looking Star Wars movie. Every fucking scene in this movie and in like settings all look immaculate. Yes. But buckle up, Chris, because I'm about to I'm about to make a James Bond series reference. So <laughs> so Skyfall comes out in 2012 and Skyfall is the movie that kind of kicks off the idea that James Bond movies are going to look beautiful and that uh, cinematography is going to be a major concern. So Skyfall is shot by Roger Deakins. It's this visually just stunning movie. Um, And James Bond movies, it just never looked like that before. And that's what I think Last Jedi is for the Star Wars universe, where like all of a sudden, even though they've always looked great, um, you know, except for certain parts of the prequels, sure. But Star Wars movies look great. Last Jedi is one where it's like cinematography is now a major concern. And we're going to make these movies, this movie beautiful. And oh my God, you're absolutely right. It is. I also love what a red movie this is. Mm -hmm. They really went into this thinking like, we're going to make this movie red and it is, and it looks amazing. Yeah. I don't know who's, whose idea was it to do that? Cause like, man, like you you think of like different movies, the color red is like not really emphasized except for revenge of the Sith. And even then it's like, not like solid red revenge of the Sith. I I think it's very orange because of Mustafar. That's basically all. Yeah, yeah, I agree there. Um, this one is just solid red. You get like red and bl- like black. You get red and gray. You get red and white. Um, it just, yeah, that color is sleek for Star Wars. I'm surprised we didn't ever get anything up to this point. Um, another thing, the space battle scenes, like our, every Star Wars battle, like space scene looks super cool. But like a lot of Star Wars space battles are usually like inside the planets themselves. But in this one, mm-hmm. you get a lot of like outer space battles, you know, like in the opening, you get the space battle, you get the space battle um, segment piece um, when like the, the Snoke ship is attacking the bases and you kind of see that um, you don't get to see things like that in Star Wars very often. And I think like those scenes makes the space parts of Star Wars look so cool. Cause most times in space, I feel like it's one ship looming over a planet ready to invade it, or it's a ship escaping to go into hyperdrive. Um, you don't really get to see scenes where they're just bullying in space throughout the whole movie, at least in my mind. The only thing I can think of is Coruscant. Um, the, the battle outside of Coruscant in episode three. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about Return of the Jedi. I think it has a good bit of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, this is a very space bound movie. uh, A lot of it, a lot of, yeah, you're you're right about that. And that is cool. I mean, my favorite thing in space in this movie is the holdout maneuver. 
Oh yeah. Also another great scene, like just absolutely shot because again, this movie is all about like hope, like, Oh, why is Poe what Matt, like Poe's creating a mutiny. And he's like, why does it, and that's another criticism people have about this movie. Why didn't Holder just tell everyone their plan? I don't oh, have an man. answer for that. We got to get into this. We got to get into this. Let, let's start with that first. And then we'll, we'll go ahead to like one thing I said, but yeah, Poe getting cheesed about Haldo's plan. Um, is a big criticism. Like, I don't think that ruins a movie for me. <laughs> like, if you're going to get mad about that, you must not like movies. So I love the post stuff. Um, the criticism of it that I understand is the fact that Poe is counterproductive to the plot of this movie, basically, and that he is actively, he doesn't realize it, but he is actively working against the, uh, the, the, objectives of the film and he sends Finn and Rose on sort of a wild goose chase to accomplish ultimately accomplish nothing. I understand if you don't like that. I get it. For me this is a very character based movie far more than it is a plot based movie. Yeah. And yeah. I think what Ryan Johnson really wanted to do is he saw okay, Poe, he's in Force Awakens, we love him, he's charming, he's not a character yet. Like he he does very little in the film, he's just cocky and cool and and charming. Um, so he's like, let's tear this guy down. Like, if we're going to make this guy a real hero in Star Wars, let's make him earn it. And the Poe segment really embodies the main theme of the movie, which is explicitly stated by Yoda in an amazing scene that we'll talk about more, which is the greatest teacher failure is. And this movie is all about characters growing through their failure. So we think that Poe, because he's Oscar Isaac and he's cool and we like him and he's in the last movie, we think he's right. And we think, yeah, that like, yeah, he is the only one that knows the right thing to do. Holdo is sort of like the, the stupid captain or the evil captain or something like that. And he has got to fight against the system, fight against the man to make to do the right thing. And we realize, no, he's wrong. He should have done his job. He should have stayed at his post. He should have done what he was told. He should have followed the proper military chain of command, but he doesn't. And we realize by the end of that sequence, oh, we shouldn't have been on Poe's side all this time because he's wrong. And I really love that because it's so unusual. Usually our hero is the hero and they got to fight against the man and blah, blah, blah. But um, he should have trusted his superior officer, basically. And he didn't. As far as why Holdo doesn't tell him the plan, obviously by the end, we realized that a lot of problems would have been solved if she had, but she didn't know that at the time. And I think at the time she thought she was following um, Leia's final wish and that Leia's final order was demoting him. So she's like, <laughs> he just got demoted by the person that I'm replacing. I'm not going to bring him into my inner circle of leaders. I'm just going to make him do his job. And that's what she thought. And to me, it makes sense. Turned out to be a mistake. But I don't think it, in that moment she would have assumed it would. I don't think there's su sufficient reason for her to think it was a mistake at the time. Right. And I like how Leia also tells um, Poe, she looks, she puts his shoulder, her hand on his shoulder and says, great men don't seek leadership. They're called to it. And then she goes, and if you don't feel like you're called to it, you'll be everything I wanted you to be, my son. I think you're mixing up your Oscar Isaac movies in your head. Oh, oh, okay. I'm just testing the audiences to see if they saw Dune or if they're just gonna <laughs> just gonna be like fucking, you know, Reddit and Twitter trolls that just want to like hate everything. You gonna talk <laughs> about Dune too on this podcast when that comes out? Dude, you know when it's gonna fucking come out? It's gonna be talked about, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna be posting all the memes of like the big brain being used as like a seat, like everyone did for *Malignant*. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! We went the whole *Force Awakens* episode without you bringing up *Malignant*. Now here we are. Oh, jeez, *Malignant*. It'll be talked about next month for sure in every episode, just to make sure we cross all the checks, we get all the check marks there. Um, but yeah, I I I liked what you said about this movie being about you know, learning from the failures. Cause like, I haven't ever seen it like that before. And I, I totally understand that. And I do agree with it. Um, and that's such an interesting point to look at this movie. And it gives, I can see why you say this movie is about a lot of hope because when people are failing, they're learning from it and then they're growing because of it. To me, I kind of saw it like, you know, 
the hopefulness that we've always gotten in Star Wars where like good guys are always going to be winning and like outsmarting the bad guys is like the opposite effect in this movie for me where like right Leia's like we're just using the decoy to ship our um our ship our smaller ships into Crete so then we can't we can just jump into light speed and then they get t- they take the bait we hide but then they're like uh uh-uh, uh the bad guys are smarter than that and this movie's also about like oh let's get the code hack the, the um the master uh, code creator uh, hacker and they get the wrong guy and he turns on them dang that plan just went down the drain um the part where Ray is really hoping to get um, Kylo to come and join her and she gets it wrong. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to be the big dog now. You know, this move to me, that's how this movie goes. It's like the good, the good guys are not winning, but they're also like having to overcome a new struggle on top of it. So they're kind of having to be like this plan that, cause like this, there's a quote in, in Force Awakens, where um, you know the movie's all about plans with Han and Finn, they're like, "I'm coming up with a plan. Why are you why are you doing this? I'm coming up with a plan." Or like, "My plan was to do this." Well, that's not how that works. But like, you know, everything works out for them in most of that movie. In this movie, they kind of come up with plans, and it just does not work for them, and they have to kind of come up with a new strategy on the fly. And I kind of like that because it, I don't feel like you've, you. I never saw the Rebel Alliance have to do that for most of the episodes four through six. It's all about. The rebels just escaping and then getting ready to do the next attack. You know, the movie's all about movement. In this movie, they're kind of like, well, we're shit out of luck because there's no one else to help us. Yeah. I mean, this is a movie where we watch our heroes fail over and over and over again. It's like Ryan Johnson really decided, I'm going to put these characters through the ringer. Like, I'm just going to make life really, really hard for them and just see how they make it out of this. And I can understand you're not liking this movie if you want star wars to be simple if you want it to be very simple it's just here are the good guys they're in the right here are the bad guys they're in the wrong and they're gonna fight and the good guys are gonna win if that's what you want the movie to be then the last Jedi doesn't give you that but i would say you need that in the third movie in the second movie this is where things should the stakes should rise things should get darker things should get harder and it should set up for a more triumphant victory in the third movie Um, So I like that this movie is about, it's about character growth. It's about characters failing, just barely getting by so that we can then get to the triumphant victory in the third movie, which I would argue we very much do, but we'll get to that Mm -hmm. later. When I think of triumph, I think of like, you know, like, like success, like what goes with success in Star Wars. For me, it's the score. This movie's score has so many great parts to fit scenes. Like, I don't know what the score, like I, I listen to certain scores and um, I think of the scenes immediately. Like you think of like the iconic, like when the, in, the millennium Falcon is going through space, like boom, 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 ban it, boom, ban it, you know, and it's shooting the tie fighters in this movie. I'm thinking of like um, the, the scene where Luke, Kylo is fighting Luke and Kylo finds out that it's not actually Luke. And he's just kind of screaming and the noise is dry, drowning him out. I think of that score. Um, I think of the the silent and quiet score that's happening um, when the, like it looks like the resistance is going to lose right off the bat, you know, just kind of drowns the, the whole room. I think of a lot of this kind of score, these kind of scores throughout the last year, more than any other Star Wars movie. Um, I don't know who was a composer. Well, it was John Williams for the, the composer this movie, but like, I don't know who was like, hey, create me a new sheet of music that's not like any of the other Star Wars movies for me and do them in these scenes. Because that's what this movie's like for me. Um, I think this is like my most listened to of all the Star Wars movies because I love the oh, score. Because cool. I think of every scene because it feels so unique to every other Star Wars movie. You don't get too many except in the last act where in the Battle of Crete where um, uh, when they're uh, when the Millennium Falcon's coming down to help out um, all those bummy speeders that are going to the, the battering ram. Other side of that, you're not getting that much nostalgic music throughout the movie. You also get a lot of Snoke music with a bow and like the throne room scene music, all new and different. Nothing that's called back to the original. Even the part when like the the Holdo maneuver is happening, and you know, like just the despair there because it's being berated. Uh, just like I don't know, this whole movie. When I think about music, I just think about each scene in the movie. You know? Yeah, man, I, I love hearing you say that. I. I don't think the score stood out to me as much as you as uh, any more than like any other Star Wars movie does, but you know, always like it. And I love that it affected you that way. Yeah. Um, speaking of effect though, I don't think there's like a character that affected the Star Wars base more than Luke Skywalker in this movie, which we haven't really talked about. 
we yeah we got it's so weird because when i saw this in theaters it never even occurred to me that people would hate this i don't know why it didn't <laughs> but i just loved it and i always have i remember like i put out you know, 2017 i think i was still using facebook so i think i put out a facebook post that said like mark hamill for best supporting actor at the oscars and i had a friend later confront me about that and be like really you really think you should win an oscar for this and i'm like oh okay like whatever i was trying to make a point like don't take it too seriously mm -hmm. but when i rewatch it now i'm like no i stand by that like i stand by that uh, this movie is mark hamill's best performance in the franchise for sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this movie just deepened my love for luke skywalker like i love luke skywalker more because of this movie um i think he just he turned luke into such a fascinating character it's such a great performance. And it's another complaint though, that I get it if you don't like it. Like I, but on the other hand, I do think you're wrong. Cause I think people just, some people just want Luke to stay the way he was in return of the Jedi forever. But I would argue that's boring. Mm -hmm. And as much as I love him return of the Jedi, like people don't stay the same forever. And mm -hmm. it doesn't fit this story because you have to ask yourself, why did he exile himself? And Luke has a great line on his own. Uh, Luke has a great line where he says to Ray, do you think I, he says, do you think I brought myself to the most unfindable place in the galaxy for no reason at all? And it's almost like he's saying that to people that hate the direction of Luke, where it's like, yeah, like he lost his pupil. He's exiled himself. How cheery did you really think he was going to be? Yes, he's going to be grumpy. Yeah, and like, bruh, Yoda couldn't beat Darth Sidious, and he just goes into exile. I have, I fail. Like, Yoda, this most powerful Jedi, takes one L from Darth Sidious and decides, I'm going to dip out for the rest of the movies, you know, until episode five. Also, another thing, um, with the whole Luke Skywalker thing, I totally agree. I like the turn that he's a grumpy hermit now, because... The big complaint about this is like, he's not that old, like hum young, hopeful Luke saw, you know, Darth Vader kill so many bad people and still saw good in him. But one bad dream from his pupil and he's like, ah, I got to kill him. I'm out. And it's like in the movie, he literally explains it was a moment that fleeted like a bad dream. Like he was like, I should do it. Oh, wait, no, I'm not going to do this kind of thing at the wrong time in the wrong place. But that's always been Luke's character. He's always been kind of like emotions first. You know, he kind of dies right into it. Um, yeah, he's uh, very hopeful. And he's very powerful. But like, let's not forget, this is the guy that also like, you know, slash Darth Vader's arm. And then in Return of the Jedi, when the Emperor or when Darth Vader mentions his sister, he just kind of screams no and starts battery ramming him again to the pulp. Um, I mean, like, like Luke Skywalker isn't this perfect Jesus character, you know? Yes, like, exactly. He's had flaws. I think this is, again, the problem with people seeing this movie is the preconceived notions that they had about these characters based on outside material and based on where the where the where it looked like the movies were going to be going after jj's like nostalgia fest for force awakens i think people were like luke's gonna come back he's gonna be a badass he's gonna train ray he's gonna fight kylo we're gonna get an old ben versus darth vader recreational moment like we did in the new hope movie and as you, you just don't get that. And I kind of, I, it's believable. You watch, you think about things from episode three to four, the Jedi that escaped the, the, the first order uh, or order 66. Like, what were they doing? They were hiding, disguising themselves, drinking, or they were um, like completely cut off from the force. You get that through all, all these different stories. Why does that make that any different for Luke? Yeah. And I, I love how Luke really shows how Ryan Johnson really thinks deeply about star wars and i love the references to the prequels that this movie does is you know force awakens it's all about that oh original trilogy yes this movie talks about the prequels and mm -hmm. he, he fully acknowledges that the jedi are failures and he's right mm -hmm. they are failures if you don't think the jedi are failures you're not paying attention to the prequels but they do and if you flips. just don't like the prequels yeah and if you just don't like the prequels and don't want to acknowledge them well that's your problem they're part of the <laughs> series like you have to you have to acknowledge them if you're going to watch a star wars movie mm -hmm. and the the jedi are failures and i think i think luke is still dealing with trauma from his father and he saw the horrible thing
I can't do this. The Jedi failed before. I thought I could do better. I couldn't. The same thing happened again. I can't let this keep happening. And he's not against the force. Like I love, I love, love the points he makes about how the force is there, whether they're a Jedi or not. Mm -hmm. And he says that if you think the force will go away because the Jedi go away, that's vanity. And he's so right. Mm -hmm. Um, But Luke is wrong about wanting the Jedi to go away. This movie is not saying Luke is right in this moment. He's wrong. He believes he's right, but he's not. And by the end of the movie, he's turned around and he says, I will not be the last Jedi. So if you think this movie is against the Jedi, it's not. It's Luke acknowledging the Jedi's failures, having a real existential crisis about it, but coming out the other side. Mm -hmm. Also, we got to remember Luke is like the only Jedi for how long? Like, yeah. Yeah. He has no one to help him or understand this stuff that he was barely grasping at the end return of the Jedi, like return of the Jedi. Luke shows up to Jabba's palace, but he's still like prime. uh, Like, like he's just like not the type of Jedi you think in the prequel movies type of prepped Jedi is like, he's kind of learning it all on himself with the help of Yoda, but like, it's not like the same kind of help like Anakin got with Obi-Wan and all the other Jedi and the inspirations around him. So like, and also the pressure, like being the last Jedi to like, you know, bring balance to the force again with also having the daddy issue. Like he, like he was not the most well-equipped teacher to lead a new generation of Jedi. Like regardless of what the EU says and regardless of what fans think of Luke Skywalker, he just wasn't that. And I've never thought that either. To me, the coolest thing about Luke Skywalker besides the hairdo was the green lightsaber. Like that was the coolest things about Luke Skywalker. Um, yeah, the sequel trilogy is woefully low on green lightsabers. Seriously. Um, I mean, the green lightsabers are cool. I mean, like they're all the so cool-, cool. They're my favorite. Yeah. All the coolest Jedi's get them. I mean, you think Liam Neeson isn't cool? Well, actually revert that quote back because Dude, Qui-Gon Jinn probably is the coolest Jedi. Hot coolest take. hairdo. Maybe the coolest hairdo next to the Obi-Wan Kenobi um, Padawan hairdo that he got. His oh, that's <laughs> ugly. Padawan hairdo is the worst. You th- I kind of like the Jedi braid. It looks kind of cool. <laughs> you but, should get one. But the Your rat tail. I, I can't grow it that long. But <laughs> but the Jedi mullet is pretty sweet too. You get it with Kylo, and you get it with Obi Wan and Anakin in Episode Three. I don't think Kylo has a mullet. I wouldn't well, call it a well, mullet. The, what would you call it? Like the long, just a long hairdo. I think he just has long hair because he has that, and Anakin got it in three, and Obi Wan had it in two. He's got like seventies rock star hair. Mm. not 80s rock star hair you see this is we got to make a tier list of jedi with the best hairdo one of these days we got to <laughs> rank the jedi dues oh man tough call tough i want to see what yoda's hairdo looks like when he's young oh yeah i don't know but but mace windu's clean scalp looks pretty sleek it does it does okay we're way out, <laughs> out top. we're way out track <laughs> right let, let me ask you this what did you think about luke's return in the mandalorian so to me, that was a response to people wanting to see what Luke was like, like before he got to the old hermit look. And to me, that it, it was such an awesome reveal. I thought it was Ahsoka at first. And then when I saw that it was Luke, I was like, there's no fucking way that they're doing this. They did. And it was really cool. But I had more questions than like disbelief than anything else. I was like, okay, so what does this mean for everything? Because when I think of Star Wars, I like the characters a lot, but I think of like timeline. I think of, I think of like, you know, where does this fit in the space and time of the, the story and the arc? But yeah, it totally was a super cool scene that showed how awesome Luke was. was. Um, but I don't need a full-fledged movie like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I admit, and, and this is a part of myself that I basically purged out and I'm glad I've, I've gotten rid of it. Is mm-hmm. It's my anger towards people that hate Last Jedi. And I had a, nerd, a knee-jerk reaction at first of like, oh, I see people who hate Last Jedi. Like, this is what you want, this boring bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've softened a lot on that sense that, and now like, I like that part in The Mandalorian uh, because it's last, it's Return of the Jedi, Luke. Mm -hmm. And it completely makes sense that it would be Return of the Jedi Luke then. It completely makes sense that at that point in the time period, he would be exactly like he is in Return of the Jedi. True. But this is 30 plus years later, a long time, a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. And if you're mad that he's changed, ask yourself, like, how much have you changed in the past, like, five years? I've changed in the last five years. I've really changed in the last 10 years. Like, people... 
people change. And this Luke has gone through a lot. Mm-hmm. And if you don't like it, I, 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 I kind of have to ask, like, do you really want to see the story of Luke continue? Or do you just want to like rewatch Return of the Jedi? And if right. you just want to rewatch Return of the Jedi, that's fine. But if you want to see Luke's story continue, this is what this is what we get. And I love it. I think I think it's phenomenal. It's kind of like the Obi-Wan and Old Ben um kind of thing because people love Ewan McGregor and they love the Obi-Wan from the prequel movies, but like Old Ben in episode four is a completely different character than the Obi-Wan we get in Return or Revenge of the Sith. That's funny. I don't really think he's that different. Uh, I think I think Obi-Wan Kenobi is a better person than Luke Skywalker is. That's maybe true, but I think old Ben is just like all about just guarding Luke, uh, guarding Luke. But he's like, he's like, no, no. Like when he sees Leia's projection marks, he's like, no, I'm I'm too old for this kind of thing. You know, like I don't want to help the, the rebellion. Like I'm just here isolated doing my own kind of thing. Oh, see, I totally disagree. I totally disagree. I think he does. I think he's just, he's trying to get Luke to come along with him. I, I think it's kind of tactic. By the way, how excited are you for the Kenobi series coming? Um, I, I don't know if I shared your thought, my thoughts with that with you, but I think it was one of those things I thought was never going to happen. It was always going to be a fan theory, but the fact that it's actually happening has me so excited. I am um, like over the moon. It's my most anticipated anything. Which is like, you know me, I'm not a star. I'm not like a, a show, like a TV show kind of guy, but like, you know, I watched Mandalorian and I fell in love with that. I was late as hell to the party for that. So like, I'm more excited for like Star Wars TV shows than like MCU stuff or like anything like Game of Thrones or any of whatever Mike Flanagan or popular Star or TV shows are kind of thing. Hey, hey you leave Mike Flanagan alone. <laughs> Otherwise I'm with you. <laughs> but but yeah, when I heard the, 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 the Kenobi thing was happening, I was like, holy shit. Like that's kind of like a generational kind of thing. Like that's like insanely hype you know what i mean i just could not yeah. believe it's actually happening it's gonna be the true follow-up to the prequels like mm-hmm. we haven't gotten even though the sequel to the prequels is technically a new hope it's you know it's not a follow-up to the prequels really and it's gonna be the true prequel sequel and uh i'm i could not possibly be more excited for yeah. it i can't i can't think of what's gonna be in all of it but but the fact that you McGregor is coming to do Obi-Wan Kenobi stuff again is just crazy to me. Like how? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. How did, you know, did he do that? As much as I love Alec Guinness to us, I mean, Obi-Wan is you and McGregor. Mm-hmm. Like he is the reason that we love that character. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's like, that's the, like, yeah, yeah, man, I'm excited for it. Um, and then that Boba Fett show is coming out. Like you said, I am. Um, I'm curious to see what that's going to be like too. Yeah. I'm really excited for that too. Like we were talking earlier about, you know, are are you like more a Jedi Sith guy or like a scoundrel smugglers guy or whatever? I have always been much more. So I'm all about the Jedi Sith. That's my favorite stuff in star Wars. Mm -hmm. But now like, I love Mandalorian stuff, like anything Mm -hmm. related to Mandalorians, Mm -hmm. man. I love that now. Bro. You just love Grogu. It's okay. Oh, I love Grogu very much. Like Mm. it's impossible. If you don't love Grogu, you have no heart and you need to go like, you know, get, get that checked. Scariest thing of last Jedi, besides all the senseless violence and death is just like when the burning of Luke's temple that Kylo does and grabs a few of the disciples, I'm conflicted. Cause like, I don't want to think that Grogu was a part of that, but I also don't want to think Grogu went with Kylo and join and is now one of the Knights of Ren. It's (laughs) yeah, I, I fully admit I have no idea what happened to Grogu. I'm not going to speculate. You know, we'll see. A part of me thinks he just goes and gets trained with Luke. And then he kind of, kind of Grogu's just like, nah, I'm good. I'm just going to go with Din and then just like leave the force. I got to think he's going to show up in Mandalorian season three. Like it, it seems like he won't, but does Disney really have the balls to do a Mandalorian season without Grogu? I don't know that they do. They want that merchandising money. All I know is they better not age the hell out of that kid. Like I want him to be a baby forever. (laughs) You, when you're a dad of a little baby, (laughs) seriously, I don't want kids, but I do want Grogu as a baby. I just want (laughs) to hold it. Um, Speaking of that, dude, so we talk about Brian Johnson. We talk about like nostalgia. We talk about like the deep cuts and understanding like the original lore of Star Wars. We mm-hmm. we get fucking ghost Yoda in this movie. When we were in theaters, my heart was like melted. I was bawling. I could not believe I was seeing Yoda in a fucking sequel, pre- a sequel trilogy movie. And it's like, it's as good as a Yoda scene in Empire Strikes Back. Mm-hmm. It is mm-hmm. a perfect 
perfect Yoda scene and it's puppet Yoda. He's not CGI. It's puppet Yoda again. He just drops so much wisdom in, in this brief little screen time. Mm-hmm. And he's a little shit. And let's face yep. it, like Yoda and Empire Strikes Back, he's a little shit. And yeah. he is in this movie. He's he's giggling. He's messing with Luke like he used to in Empire. And I just, <laughs> he has just so many great lines. Uh, when Luke's like, oh no, even though Luke is sort of like posturing that he's going to burn down the <laughs> Jedi Temple, he's not going to burn down the mm-hmm. Jedi Temple. He doesn't have the guts for that. And then Yoda does it. And he's like, oh no, the sacred Jedi text. Oh, read them, have you? <laughs> Page turners, they were not. Man, <laughs> that's screenwriting right there, folks. Seriously, my favorite quote from him in that movie was, oh, Skywalkers, always looking to the horizon. And to me, that's like solidifying Luke's hope. And like, because like Luke ex- excommunicated himself from the force. He, Ray finds that out about Luke, but Luke gets to sit with his old master who he hasn't talked to for God knows, maybe since Return of the Jedi, probably. Who knows? Um, and he's sitting and talking to him about reflecting on, you know, who they are is like Jedi. And I like how Yoda mentions the Skywalkers because like he acknowledges that maybe like that's how Anakin was when he was training at the Jedi temple possibly. And that just how the Skywalker family is like, they were just always looking to, you know, the future and like, you know, hopefulness. And I really like that small scene where they're, where it's like the cameras behind both of them and watching the temple kind of burn and they're just sitting there admiring it almost in a way. It's really, it's very nostalgic and it's just like very like comforting. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And I love seeing Luke and Yoda now being the two old guys, yeah. whereas like Yoda used to be the old one. Luke was the young tra- trainee. Uh, and now they're the two old dudes. And Yoda says, uh, we are what they grow beyond. That is the true burden of all masters. It's such a it's such a good line. <sighs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, this movie is so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's phenomenal. Like I, I really said, love it. The high, I mean, the highs of this movie are maybe the highest of all the Star Wars movies. Like, there's so many iconic parts to this movie for me that I think are my favorite parts of all Star Wars are in Last Jedi. There um, are a lot of things in this that are some of my favorite things in the franchise. Yeah, yeah. Like, so people are like, "Oh, I want to see Star Wars fighting." You know, I want to see the prequel Jedi battles of Darth Maul and Obi Wan Kenobi, the Mustafar scenes and stuff like that. But yeah, those scenes are amazing and drawn epic battles. But like the the throne room scene in this movie is maybe the best choreographed Star Wars movie, and they don't have to do a bunch of flips. It's also the best looking. It is one of the best action scenes in the franchise. Do you remember your reaction to that in the theater? Yeah. Well, first I kept thinking that throne room was gorgeous. Like, and yeah. then I kept thinking fucking Snoke is wearing this golden robe. Like he's this like, I, I, it's such a weird getup for a villain. He's wearing like this really bright gold, like robe. And he's just kind of booling on his, like his throne. And I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? He feels like a, like a, a, a space gangster than like a Sith sort of, we don't know if he's like a Sith master or anything like that. We just kind of think he's like a force user. That's a bad guy. Um, and I'm thinking, who are these like, you know, in, like in Royal Imperial Guard knockoffs? Because I, I didn't think they were going to be used at all during the movie. But obviously we get like hints of it in the beginning where Kylo is like rising up to uh, Snoke and they kind of like flex their their weapons. Um, that whole scene with, like I said in the beginning of this podcast, that whole scene with Snoke, Ray, and Kylo. Uh, uh, and, yeah, in the, that throne room. I had no idea what was going to happen at all. Yeah. When, when we were leading up to that, I remember in the theater thinking, are they just doing return of the Jedi again? Mm-hmm. Cause mm-hmm. it felt like just a retread of return of the Jedi, but then it turns out so differently. <laughs> First of all, I love how the movie sets up that Snoke and Kylo have a bad relationship. So bad. And Kylo does not like Snoke <laughs> and it seems, and you know, we think that maybe Kylo is going to kill Ray. Well, no, I thought maybe Kylo was going to try to kill Ray. I didn't think Ray was going to die but I was not expecting Kylo to kill Snoke. And that Mm -hmm. is a brilliant moment. And I'm not quite sure if he planned to kill Snoke um, or if it was just kind of a gut reaction. I I lean towards the fact that it was a gut reaction and that he didn't want to kill Rey. I do think Kylo was attracted to Rey and he is very interested in her. And they're on this, on this like converging path where they're, I, I do like how Rise of Skywalker leads up to this whole idea that they're a dyad in the force because you totally feel that in this mm-hmm. movie where they feel like two halves of a whole. 
Um, so I don't think Kylo was ever going to kill Ray. And I think he would probably rather kill anybody rather than kill Ray. And he does, but we think, we think maybe he's turned, but he hasn't. Um, he's still a dick. He's still <laughs> awful. And he's just like, you know what? I'm, I don't want to be a Sith, but I don't want to be a Jedi. I'm sick of all of this old bullshit. Let the past die. I just want to rule the world. And Ray's like, no, that's not, you're getting the wrong answer from this. <laughs> to me, it was always like Kylo was doing what he thought Vader should have always done. Or he, or at least I feel like is what Vader wanted to do oh, is kill yeah. the master. Cause Ray never the, loved Palpatine. Vader never loved Palpatine either. Right. But he had to keep it a, a secret for so long. This animosity that was built for such a long time and this blind faithfulness because he's just, He's so depressed with himself and his decisions of where he is in his life. He has no choice but to do what's being told. In Kylo, I feel like he starts to get into that pivotal moment that Vader kind of never got a chance to do because he gets to get a reach with Rey earlier on than Vader got to with his son. And it, it kind of gives Kylo this idea that I will get support. You know, like I can get rid of this monkey on my back, so to speak, which is my master who constantly berates me and calls me useless, calls, ha, says, calls, you know, says I have doubt within me, um, calls me a child with a mask, you know, demasculates me on top of that as well. Um, to me, it was just him saying like, you know what, I'm going to rectify the certain inequities that my grandfather, <laughs> you know, didn't get to do with Palpatine, which was kill my master and take ownership for my own destiny and take control of this fucking first order. And, you know, it kind of, it feeds out to what the kind of Kylo we get in, you know, rise of Skywalker, which we'll talk about next episode um, with that idea that Kylo is just doing differently. What he saw was wrong from his grandfather, which is, you know, I am the strongest. I am going to become the leader now. He am tired of like the politics of like the Imperial officers in the hierarchy. I am the force user. I am the one with the fucking lightsaber. I should be ruling. Um, and that's what kind of I've gotten with Kylo when he killed snow at first. I was like, what the hell is going on here? Is he going to be good or what? And then um, you just don't get an answer. You don't get a character like Kylo Ren in all of star Wars, you know? So like every decision he makes in the movie is so unique and I'm all for it. Yeah. He's such an interesting character. And I do think of the three sequel movies, this is the Kylo movie. This mm -hmm. is the movie where Adam Driver shines the most. This is the movie where his character is the most interesting. They got rid of the mask for this movie, which mm -hmm. Ryan Johnson is a very simple explanation for that, which is just, I have this great actor, Adam Driver. I'm not going to cover up his face. <laughs> so I'm going to get rid of the mask. And, and I, I'm actually one of the people I like that they bring the mask back in rise of Skywalker. But at the same time, I love that we don't have it for this movie. I love that this is Kylo's movie and we get to mm -hmm. look him in the eyes for so much of the movie. Yeah. Speaking of looks real quick though. Yeah. Man, how come this sequel trilogy could not get Ray's costumes, right? She almost looks identical throughout the entire movie, all three movies. Yeah, that's that's really something I'll probably talk about more in Rise of Skywalker. And then I want, in certain ways, I like her costume in Rise of Skywalker. But on the other hand, I wish they drastically switched it up. Mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't. Yeah, she mostly looks, there, there are differences, but she mostly looks the same through the three movies. She's wearing like Karen Capri's in this movie with black boots. Karen Capri's? Yeah, she's wearing Capri's throughout this movie. It's Is, like, are Capri's a Karen thing? Oh yeah, dude. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Soccer mom's capris 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You either wear pants or shorts. Either way, not capris. <laughs> who's got who's who's got the best drip in this movie? Honestly, Finn. Interesting. I I I also when he's wearing the imperial uniform, he looks pretty cool. He does look pretty sharp. Yeah. 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 Post looking good though. Got his jacket. Pose always looking good. It's true. Uh-huh. But uh yeah, 100% I love how Kylo takes his mask off in this movie. Um, and when he, when he betrays um, Snoke, I love how it feels like this big thing, but it's also like, kind of like, well, we're done with this character. Now we can move on kind of thing. You know, it just like yeah, cause Snoke never really caught on. No, he didn't. The coolest thing about Snoke was the hologram of him being gigantic and me wondering if he was going to be gigantic. But other than that, I always felt like the first order was like a band of like, officers in kylo you know like like yeah. snoke is barely in these movies up to this point except for the part where he's like bullying hawks yeah he just feels like a placeholder and it turns out in the next movie 
that's exactly what he is. Yeah. Yeah. I love the part. Like, I mean, besides that beautiful throne room sequence of events, like that's like, just, that's just like peak star Wars right there. Um, I love Hux after the aftermatch and Kylo's knocked out and he goes like, what should we be doing? Our Supreme leader is dead. And then Kylo is like, I'm Supreme leader now. You know, I love that transition of power. Me too. Just talking about something just before that moment. I got to ask you something, man. So in the wake of rise of Skywalker, now that we've seen that movie, what do you think about the scene where Kylo says that Ray's parents were no one in hindsight? I think he was bluffing. I feel like he was just trying to manipulate Ray into joining him because, because he didn't actually know himself, but he always held this thing over Ray that he knew something that she didn't know. That's the only thing I can think of because why else would he ever say it's nobody? And he could say like, there was no plan that Disney had for, you know, race things, but like, the way they handle race parents throughout all the movies, the only thing I can think of is the TV spots are like thinking, what are Ray? Who are Ray's parents? Who are Ray's parents? You know, it would be so anticlimactic if they are just nobodies, you know? You know, man, I, I love you, man. Uh, that is such a, I love that you took it in that direction because I think so many people would just say, well, that's what Ryan Johnson wanted, but JJ Abrams wanted something different and there was no plan and they disagreed. So blah, blah, blah. And to me, I, I would say like, Maybe we don't know, maybe, but that's a boring way to think about storytelling. Mm -hmm. So let's take this a little bit more interesting way and assume that this is all, this is a world. This is a story. What does this mean? So a few things, I mean, I, I I kind of agree with the bluffing thing and that I think we should point out that Kylo's goal in this scene is not to tell the truth. That's Mm -hmm. not the goal. Mm -hmm. The goal is to diminish Ray's self-worth so so she would be more likely to join him. It's really like a very typical abusive boyfriend or girlfriend really move and to say that like, oh, no one will love you but me. You're not worth anything, so you better stay with me. And I do think that's the tactic here. That's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Also, if he does know anything about Ray's parents, it stands to reason that the only reason he would know anything about her parents is because he can see into her. And Ray didn't know anything about her grandfather. Mm -mm. So her parents being no one is all she would know. Mm -hmm. Um, So it makes sense that if Kylo does know something, he just knows the same thing that she knows. Right. In the Rise of Skywalker answers that Ray's parents technically are nobodies. They have a lineage, but they're just, they they, they were rejects to um, her grandfather, essentially. And they they explain that Rise of Skywalker. And I didn't, in in solo, I was going to call him Ben, Kylo up to this point, um, has no Skywalker ability to look, have dreams about the future or look into the future like Anakin got to do. Yeah. Um, Luke didn't even get that. Luke just had a strong presence of good in people. But like Kylo doesn't have anything sort of like that at all. He doesn't have that kind of power. Um, and up to that point, he's basically doing what he was doing in Force Awakens where he was telling Rey, you need a teacher and I can train you the, in the ways of the Force. Because like we said in last episode, he realizes there's someone just like him out there why wouldn't you want to join up with them? You know, it's the same thing Green Goblin does to Spider-Man in the first movie where he offers him, you know, a way to join up with him so they could do things together. It's what every villain does with a hero in a lot of other sort of mediums is like they want to, and the bad guys want to convince the good guys to join them because they need their help, but also to test them to see like, you know, can I convince this person to join me or no? And yeah. Ray and Ray up to this point is softening on Kylo. Kylo is conflicted. Why wouldn't he want to ask somebody who's seeing good in him, seeing at least something other than abuse that Snoke had given him up until this point? Why wouldn't he want that person to help him? Yeah. Why would they say no? Yeah, because he really wants to rule the galaxy with Ray. He doesn't want to rule the galaxy with Snoke because Ray is way cuter than Snoke is. Right. <laughs> Seriously. And don't you remember when Kylo told Ray, he's like, you and I could rule the galaxy together as father and son. You know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, there are parallels. It's poetry. <laughs> it rhymes. Right. Um, th- yeah, this moment that Ray is no, is no one, it, came, it definitely, I saw it came to mean a lot to a lot of different people. And for a couple of reasons, and one reason that I think is really good and one reason that's not so good. The good reason is it meant a lot to people because people thought like, oh, I love that our hero is a nobody because it says that 
heroes can come from anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's great. And, uh, and, and if Rise of Skywalker disappointed you in that way, I understand. But the other thing is, I do think there were certain fans of this movie that used this moment to stick it to people that they thought were annoying, who are the Star Wars nerds who were always theorizing, like, who are Ray's parents? Who is Ray? He's who a Kenobi. Snoke? Yeah, is Ray a Kenobi? Is Snoke Mace Windu? Blah, blah, blah. Like all this nerdy theorizing. <laughs> there were definitely people out there that thought those people were annoying, that didn't care about that kind of thing. And when this moment came along, they were like, ha, you dorks. See, she's nobody. And I think we need to be honest with ourselves and say, that's not cool. You know, yeah. um, one thing that kind of in hindsight means a lot more than it even did upon first watch is when they're fighting through the force for um, the Skywalker lightsaber, like when they're yeah. force grabbing it and like they're both pulling for it and the lightsaber is not budging one way or the other, because in force awakens, they both do that and it completely goes straight to Ray. And in this movie, it's conflicted. And I think in hindsight, what that means is that that lightsaber is technically a birthright to Kylo, but Ray up to now at this point, being bonded with Leia, had that bond with Han and having a bond now with Luke, she has grown more into this family of the Skywalkers than ever before. And this movie is giving a hint that she might be more of a Skywalker than Kylo is up to this point. Yeah. Like she earned something that was supposed to be his birthright that he Mm -hmm. threw away. Mm-hmm. And I think I, in high, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that um, I love that they destroy the lightsaber. To me, I thought that set up for the next movie for Ray to have her own lightsaber. Right. And I hate that that didn't happen. That's <sighs> one of my big disappointments with Rise of Skywalker is she gets her own lightsaber at the end, but not at the beginning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm with you there, man. I'm with you there. Uh, but yeah, we uh, so also. Man, do you when you I always think about this whenever I see it. When Luke shows up when the hope is gone for this for the uh, the resistance. Chills. Chills, yes. And I love the score when he's just kind of showing up and walking in the shadows and like talks to Leia and then decides to go out there and face them all. And everyone just kind of eye, eyes like jaws dropped and watching. And he pulls out the blue lightsaber. I was so oblivious to the fact that the lightsaber got destroyed. Like you know, yeah <laughs> a cu- like a ha- couple minutes before all that there are a lot of hints that we did not realize yeah seriously even upon like rewatch sometimes i'm like oh yeah he uses the blue lightsaber you know it's kind of crazy how like in the moment you forget about those things that's why i'm thinking with like star wars fans sometimes like oh i didn't like this i'm like well go watch the movie again maybe there's something you would have missed because we all forgot about this part yeah, it, you got to watch Star Wars movies over and over and over again, like Chris and I do. You just have to. 100%. <laughs> um, how about that moment, though, when uh, when Luke comes out and Kylo's like, fire every gun you have on that man. <laughs> that is such a different like vibe to Star Wars up to that point. Again, because it shows how childish Kylo is and how different of a character he is, too. Yeah, and he hates Luke so much. And he is so afraid of Luke. So he doesn't even want to go down there and face him. He's just like, please blow him up. So I don't have to deal with him. (laughs) Oh, but dude, that, that whole sequence of events from Luke just showing up and talking to Leia and saying like, I know what you're going to say. I changed my hair and stuff like that all the way up to him. So good. Yeah. And all the way to him brushing off what just happened. You know, I didn't for a second think wait how did he survive all that or like his hair looks shorter now he's wearing a different getup now all these things i didn't even think about (laughs) and his feet don't make marks in the salt which they make that emphasis right before even the whole fucking battle starts yep ryan johnson man you really know how to create moments that make us forget other small little details yeah we just get so caught up in the emotion and the epicness like star wars movies are inherently epic you know Mm -hmm. i would say maybe the only soul star i I gave it away the only star wars movie that's less epic is solo but overall they tend to feel like that Mm -hmm. this is one of the most like this movie feels like absolutely mythic storytelling yeah like it feels like all the like i this movie has the vibe like it's the last of the whole series at times too like it feels like everything's at stake you know, some people uh, choose to believe that it's the last of the series. I'm not one of those people, but I know they're out there. Crazy, crazy. Uh, but it makes Rise of Skywalker just a little bit better at some moments because of this movie. Like when they call out to everyone, even using Leia's special code to see if anyone's going to come and no one came. 
until the third movie. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that moment is so good. I am so excited to talk about Rise of Skywalker. I have so much I want to say. I have so much defenses because it's funny. Like I know a lot of people hated this movie. I don't know a lot of people that hate Last Jedi. I like in my in my personal life, I've only ever talked to one person I know that doesn't like The Last Jedi. Um, and like the people that like the circles that I run in online tend to be Last Jedi fans for the most part. It's Rise of Skywalker that I feel like is the one that people hate. Dude, and I just hate how Chris Terrio dropped the ball. Oh boy. <laughs> we'll get there. What what is what is one I love every exchange with Kylo and Luke in this movie because it feels like an exchange you have with your friends, but to a lesser aggressive degree, where he's like, Have you come to apologize? No. And then he's like, I'll kill you, I'll kill them. You know, just like all your these friends say, I'll kill you a lot. Oh, yeah. Especially when I put like my letterbox reviews up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mitch, when you posted the mm-hmm. antlers review. <laughs> If you have antlers, you might need, if you like antlers, you, if I said, if you have antlers, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, but this, every exchange, I love that part. And I love when Luke's just like, no, you're wrong with everything. And it flashes to Ray. you know, also the name drop of the words last Jedi in this movie. I don't think any other movie has the name of the title of star Wars, except in this movie. Like, I don't think any part goes like, I, I'll tell you, like, I guess there's been an awakening, you know? Yeah, but, that's but this is a yeah. I mean, I th- I think you might be right. Um, except in Phantom Menace, when like Darth Maul comes out and Qui Gon says, "This guy is a Phantom Menace." Oh, no, bro. He just said, "This boy is a fucking menace to society. <laughs> this is a menace to the Republic." Absolutely fatherless activity over Seriously, here. Seriously, like if Darth Maul <laughs> in twenty twenty one, he'd be rocking some Tims with the double bladed lightsabers and a solid chain. Like he is on some demon <laughs> hours in the Phantom of the Menace. I love Darth Maul. Yeah, I don't care who knows it. So cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Last Jedi, total Aces movie for me. It's Aces for me too. It's one of my absolute favorite Star Wars movies. It's so say, good. I, yeah, I was gonna say this has a movie with like some of like the strongest points of all the entire series, but also it gave birth to some of the grossest toxic fandoms as well out of this movie. Like I feel like I feel like controversy and like crazy opinions were like died down for a long time. But once this movie came out, I felt like it was like a floodgate. Like remember the Kathleen Kennedy outcries and like oh, the man. Disney ruining everything with star Wars and like the loot, the, the Ray being overpowered, you know, aspects of all this movie. Um, and uh, yeah, like this movie really gave some discourse. <laughs> It did. And like I said, there are certain things about this movie where if you don't like it, I get it. But if you're one of those people that's still throwing a fit about a movie online after two years, (laughs) uh, like I have no sympathy for you. You really need to go get a new hobby. Seriously. Seriously. And people, I, one of the complaints I saw in a lot of retrospectives were like, I don't like BB eight, this movie. I don't like the porks. They're not that funny. They're not. They're, it's cr- And they're How like, dare it, you? and then like the comedy, they're like, it's cringe MCU like comedy. And I'm like, the um, MCU took like it's Star Wars humor. Like, like the MCU really just copy pasted Star Wars style of humor and put it in all of their movies. Right. Also, like they're owned by the same brand. <laughs> like, I mean, you, are you? I don't know. Like people who think they're better writers than like the writers for like a Star Wars movie. Like, come on. <laughs> you know. I remember when I uh, a little while ago I rewatched uh, Revenge of the Sith, and during the first act of that movie, I thought. Well, this is just the MCU. Like mm, every yeah. all MCU comedy just feels like the first act of Revenge of the Sith. Like so they totally true. just copy pasted George Lucas. I feel like. Yeah, remember when Obi Wan goes, "I hate draw, I hate flying," you know, and it's like, "Oh, that's so funny," you know. Oh, Pal- um, uh, Senator Palpatine, Sith lords are a speciality. Like, oh my gosh, that's such a Tony Stark moment. <laughs> these people so yeah like i just have no tolerance if you're like oh star wars feels too much like the mcu star wars is probably the most influential thing on the mcu the See, star wars and sam raimi spider-man seriously and also it's like the people complain about the star wars stuff it's like man is it any star wars good star wars though because it's like we talked about last episode the this this property was such an adormant sleep and now we're getting so much stuff up until yeah. this point 
I love it. I'm not feeling any fatigue whatsoever, honestly. Um, did you hear that it was an, it was another controversy online? Kathleen Kennedy just renewed her contract with Lucasfilm to stay in charge for the next three years. Oh, no, I didn't know that. But as long yep. as she keeps us getting some of these high quality shows and spinoff movies, I'm fine with it. Yeah, some people are mad about that. They're like, look at her track record. And I'm like, oh, five movies that I think are that I love and a great TV show. Yep. Let's let's keep it going. And work before that, too. Some people have pointed out that like a problem with her is how many directors have gotten fired (laughs) off of Star Wars movies. (laughs) And it's a decent point, but I really think Star Wars is a universe where you, if you're going to make a Star Wars movie, you have to play ball. Like you Mm -hmm. can't make something totally different that doesn't feel like it's in the universe. You do have to worry about canon. You do have to worry about what's in books and what's in comic books. And if you're not willing to play ball with that kind of thing, I think you have to go because like you can't make a Joker in the Star Wars universe, you know, like some people maybe want that, but you can't because it's a it's a very defined sandbox that you have to play in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's funny you bring that up because that was in my notes. Like, you know, we talk about this movie having a lot of hopefulness and like learning from mistakes, but you could look at this movie as being very nihilistic and like having dark tones out like that are different from especially The Force Awakens, you know, Um But then it's like people want like movie like they how many times do people talk about on the Internet? I want a Star Wars movie. It'd be really cool if you got like a a clone trooper perspective movie that's like saving Private Ryan. And they just the bad batch. Right. Maybe I haven't seen the bad batch, but they're like, I want it to be super dark and I want it to be battle hardened and ridden. And like I want a movie where like Luke or Ray is like tempted really hard by the dark side that she's a bad guy and everyone has to kill her. And she's like, (laughs) you know, it's like these insanely silly and like trying to be dark night-esque type of things in star wars and it's like why is that the threshold for to separate it's weird anything that's like remotely pop culture is not validated or valid in the eyes of a lot of people in the mainstream if it isn't insanely dark or goes that extra level of like joker i guess in a weird way or like Dark yeah. Knight or Joker. It's like, that's the threshold that makes the movie good or not good. And just like a part of the corporate machine. I think that's just a very immature line of thinking. Yeah. You know, like even like and- Spider-Man, like people are saying like this new Spider-Man was it's supposed to be super dark and it's supposed to be like, who, who said that? <laughs> dude, there's people on, there's there is people- no way that new Spider-Man movie is dark at all. I can't even see Tom Holland being remotely in a dark movie at all. <laughs> But we're like, no. this movie's supposed to take risks. It's supposed to be darker than any of the MCU movies up to this point. And I'm like, you just are wishing. You really. That's like I remember before Iron Man three came out. People said that like, uh, the the Mandarin was the darkest and best superhero villain since Heath Ledger's Joker. And then I saw Iron Man three, and I'm like, you you people don't know anything. Why are you talking about movies that haven't even come out yet? This is why editors and writers get paid what they do. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, anyway, anyway. But anyway, I um last Jedi, I had a lot of fun getting all this off my chest for the internet to either gloat with me or trash me. Um, but other than that, I'm very happy with um talking about the the I mean for the first time really, really talking about Last Jedi because I think other people just thought like Chris likes the movie, um, Daniel loves the movie too, and then Ghost in the Shell, the rest is history kind of thing. But, you know, we got a chance to finally talk about it. And I, I, I hope people will listen to this and maybe feel the urge to rewatch the movie and look at it from a different perspective. Or at the very least, if you like The Last Jedi, let us know all your thoughts down below. Am I right? Yeah. Can I name three, uh, three more things I love about this movie? Yes. Give me all the smoke. Okay. So one, I love the fight between Finn and Phasma. I think when people say that, like, oh, Captain Phasma never got to do anything cool. I'm like, uh, no, that fight scene between Finn and her. That is a cool fight scene. And Mm -hmm. uh, this movie is all about killing your boss. You know, (laughs) Kylo kills his boss. Finn kills his boss. This is a very like, you know, anti bad boss movie. And so it's like, you should just kill him. (laughs) Yeah. Hawks almost killed um, Kylo at one point when you pulled up. He would have if he could. He would have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love the Porg and the Falcon. Yes. That's like one of those parts in the movie that's like the comedy fits really well. I think it makes it more fun. Also, I never realized how beautiful that scene is when the when the Millennium Falcon goes into that cave and it's all red diamonds. Oh, yes. I was like, holy shit. Look how beautiful that looks. Look at that. <laughs> so good. And then last little thing. I love the moment between Holdo and Leia. 
the little final moment when when Leia leaves and Holdo's gonna stay behind. It's just like we don't even know Holdo that well, and it's just like this really sweet, heartfelt moment. I mean, I think our effect, at least my affection for Laura Dern, kind of crosses over to Holdo, and I just think that's man, it's just such a lovely little moment. To me, yeah, and to me, it's also like um, Laura Dern talking to Carrie Fisher too. You know, absolutely. Yeah, this movie with you. Yeah, this movie gets like such a good like all three of these movies get a good understanding of like not just the characters, but like the actor to actor relationships in a way, you know, like, yeah, there's, there's always like a hint of like meta commentary to these Mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I really enjoy that. Yeah. That Haldo scene with, with Leia also just like the, every Leia in this movie stresses me out more than anything. Even in first watch, multiple watches, it always stresses me out with Leia and her character and like what's going on with her because like, it's such a roller coaster. Oh, did you think that, uh, did you think she died when oh, she was out 100%, in space? 100% thought she died. I thought so too. And I was so disappointed. I was like, this is how we're taking her out? No, but then we don't. Mm-hmm. And great. even when and people call it, oh, Mary Poppins going through space. You know, that's Those not people Leia. people are idiots. Right. But I'm like, <laughs> so I'm just happy stupid. she's just fucking alive. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's Leia using the force. How can you not like that? That's I mean, yeah. fucking cool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, anything else you want to say about last Jedi before we get going? I don't think so. I love this movie. I think it's interesting. I think mm-hmm. it's challenging. I think it's beautifully shot. Well acted as incredible action. It's exciting. It's thrilling. It's scary at times, man. I just love it. I'm glad I had the time in the crayons to talk about this movie for people who don't like it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know what? I, uh, I, so I always have whatever movie I'm talking about on a podcast on in the background, no sound. Mm -hmm. I am watching the throne room fight and it is still incredible. I love all the grunting that Adam driver does in that scene. I love the lack of score. How there isn't music and you just hear the swishing of the lightsabers and oh my God, that that he uses the lightsaber as almost like a gun just (laughs) real quick and just go through a guy's head. Mm -hmm. We've never seen that. We've never seen a lightsaber do that before. Mm -mm. We also haven't seen any empire bodies body. The, the heroes like this movie does too. Yeah. It turns, it takes the Royal guards and lets them do something awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead of just looking cool. Yep. Mm-hmm. but yeah no i enjoyed this episode um daniel where can people find you to learn more about the last jedi facts uh this is the only place that i've talked about the last jedi but if you'd like to follow my podcast it is the cobwebs podcast where we talk about old movies we dust off classic cinema to see what it has to offer today uh we're on all podcast apps you can follow us on twitter and instagram at cobwebs pod you can follow me personally on twitter at epler daniel but please don't hit me up if you want to say Everything that you just said is wrong. Because honestly, I don't really want to talk about that. Bruh, seriously. And if you want to hear my um, opinions on things, follow me at Hurtastic underscore Chris. I've been seeing a lot of um, wannabe clout chasers say, you know, it'd be really cool if like Chris started his YouTube channel again. It's not happening. But if you want to watch old videos, you can check us out at Hurtastic Reviews as well on YouTube. Um, I might do like a TV review. I've been seeing a lot of people in my DMs ask me for that. Broke boys. But um, <laughs> other than, yeah, email the show inside the sequel.com uh, or at gmail.com. Like, please, like, email us. Like, give us your thoughts and your opinions on Last Jedi. I want all the smoke on that. Um, but yeah, definitely, if you missed last episode on The Force Awakens, definitely check that out so you can get caught up for this one. And then gear your asses and your ears for when we talk about the rise of Skywalker next week on Friday. Um, but other than that, Uh, My name's Chris at Inside the Sequel. And remember, if you aren't standing The Last Jedi, do you really care about cinema? Anyway, 